So here I am working on some dumb crap, when suddenly... This shows up in my recommended, and I'm like, Say what? So I watch it, and holy shit. Some people last video were like, Wow, NBC is so lazy and or incompetent. They can't spend the two seconds of time required to figure out that Peterson doesn't like the alt-right, and they don't like him. But this is like, no, 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 no. You know how I showed clips from other sources of Peterson to discredit the NBC piece? <laughs> well, that wasn't even necessary. Because he counters what they say about him in the actual interview. They just edited all those parts out. So let me show you a side-by-side -side comparison so you can see what Peterson actually said and how they twist it to fit their narrative. However, I received this information with grief. In a time of polarizing politics, firing Bob Mueller would be the wrong Dr. Jordan Peterson refuses to be pigeonholed. You're not going to decide what words I'm going to use. In the past two years, the Canadian psychologist and academic has been adopted as a hero of the Donald Trump-loving alt-right. What You said that you became disillusioned with socialism. I became disillusioned with ideology. I with ideology say. in general. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, that's certainly not something that's changed. I mean, I don't like ideologues. I mean, I don't like ideologues. Adopted as a hero of the Donald Trump-loving alt-right. We know what happens when, when, when right-wing governments adopt racial superiority doctrines, right? We know what happens. We, we get an extraordinarily toxic form of tribalism and, and blood. So that seems like a very bad idea. Adopted as a hero of the Donald Trump-loving alt-right. In a way, you're appealing to a certain political viewpoint. Well, that's, that's what the, people claim. That's your fans. Your fan base seems to come from that side. No, I don't agree with that at all. They stack up everywhere from the radical left, the radical leftists don't like me, to the right. And there, there are people all along that spectrum, and there's no way of identifying. Because they, they fall along that entire spectrum, there's no real reason to pull out a particular subset of them and say, well, they're indicative of the lot. Now, the radical leftists like to do that, and they say, well, you're probably a right-winger, because right a radical right-winger, let's say, because radical right-wingers also oppose us. It's like, well, yeah, everyone to the left of the ra everyone to the right of the radical left is not a radical right-winger. It encompasses the entire spectrum. Ooh, Are you a so, radical right-winger? <laughs> it's a silly question. What's the evidence for that? I'm, I'm not asking for. I'm, I'm asking you. It's ridiculous to defend yourself against an accusation that has no grounds. So. What uh, is your political perspective? I don't really have a political perspective. I'm not trying to play a political game. And I don't think that the problem that we're having right now is a political problem. I think it's deeper than that, which is what I said right from the beginning, mm -hmm. which is why I think that what I'm doing is resonating. So let's consider, my, let's consider me a psychological diagnostician. Now I don't like this answer because it's not direct enough. So it allows complete butthead to project their secret alt-right fantasies onto Peterson. The first big mistake that media outlets have made with Jordan B. Peterson is that they think that his points are the point, and they're not. If I had to guess, I believe there are two reasons for why Peterson answered this way. The first is that perhaps self-servingly, he doesn't want to nail himself down to a label in any way because he doesn't want to turn off any part of his audience or potential audience, since he knows he appeals to both conservatives and non-SJW liberals. Or two, if we're going to be more charitable, we could theorize that even though he has said time and time again that he doesn't agree with the alt-right, he doesn't want to come out super insulting or hard against them since Peterson believes Believes he can sway people away from the alt-right, so he doesn't want to close that door. He was quick to insult MGTOW in the past, but he was also very quick to regret that. And so, I'm sorry that I called them pathetic weasels, but I, but I outlined my reasons, and so yes, I do regret that. I have to be careful. So the, to the extent that your fan base does come from what we would call the alt-right, what do you think of them? What do you think of them as um, obviously their ideology is very amorphous. Well, I think that anybody who plays identity politics is playing a bad game. I don't care whether they're playing it on the left or the right, and I've made that perfectly clear. <laughs> Although, perhaps, I haven't concentrated on it as much as I might, but like I said, I don't see the right as a, as a threat in, 
in the university campuses, for example, and that's a large part of the place that I've been fighting this battle. No, shh, he is legend. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't like identity politics. I don't care who's playing it. And so the alt-right tends towards identity politics, and, you know, maybe they thought, maybe there was a proportion of them who were hoping I was their boy when I came out against the radical left. Because if you come out against the radical left, it's not obvious where you sit on the political spectrum, right? You could sit anywhere on the political spectrum. But I'm, a, I'm for the sovereignty of the individual, and that isn't what you're for if you're an identitarian. You're for the sovereignty of the group. So what do you say to those who say that you are an alt-right thinker? I don't generally say a lot. It's like that's an easy excuse if you happen to be a supporter of the radical left, and that's where most of that's coming from. Well, here's what it is. Um, the radical left thinks their policies are reasonable. So then someone like me comes up and says, hey, you're not reasonable at all. Well, then they have two choices. Either I'm reasonable and there's something wrong with their policies, or I must be part of the reprehensible radical right. It's like, well, that's an easy choice. It's like, well, you're a fascist, or you're a Nazi, or you're a transphobe, or you're a bigot, or you're anti-Semitic, or, uh, or you're an Islamophobe, or... You know, there's a whole panoply of, of, of terms that can be used to deny the validity of your opponent's viewpoint. Little did he know that that was exactly what NBC was going to do. Well, I'm no fan of the radical left, but that doesn't make me a member of the radical right. It's a wishful thinking on the part of the radical left. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. Diversity, inclusivity, equity. All of those things together, in particular, make up a very toxic brew. He takes direct aim at the far left and its effects on young men. Of course, they knowingly ignore all of the times he said he was against the alt-right in the interview. The left has degenerated into identity politics, obviously, and that's no secret. And then the right-winger right -winger types, well, they're playing the same game, and they increasingly say that. They say, well, look, the game is identity politics. Okay, fine. I like how even in the extended version, they cut out right as he's about to say some negative things about the far right. Direct aim at the far left and its effects on young men, whom he says have been hurt by a society that overvalues political correctness and pushes them away from traditional male roles. Hmm, let's see how they came to that conclusion. Chaos is something that you say is distinctly feminine, whereas order it's symbolized, is something it's symbolized. It's symbolized by the feminine, yeah. Okay, so you posit that. So this almost seems like, in certain ways, an antidote to femininity. Is that not the case? Under other political conditions, it could have been an antidote to order. Mm. But I think that the fundamental threats that our society faces now are th threats from the side of chaos, from the side of, side of destabilization, rather than... F in our culture, at least, rather than from the side of tyranny. So to translate for people who don't speak Peterson, or are just being dishonest, he just said that the only reason he's focused on the far left or the things he classifies as chaos is because he believes that they are currently the side that is out of balance. And if it was the far right, and the traits he associates with order that were out of balance, he would be talking about that instead. Under other political conditions, it could have been an antidote to order. You see? Peterson cares about the balance. Let me just get this straight. You're saying that- You gotta deal with it! His new self-help book, 12 Rules for Life, is already a bestseller. Hundreds of thousands subscribe to his online lectures, his speeches regularly attract protests, I'm not arguing about your and his new speaking tour is selling out. It feels like a movement, and I'm excited to be a part of it. I think he's dangerous because of the sorts of people that he enables. You know, I didn't talk about this in the first video, but notice how he never actually says who he thinks Peterson enables. We're just led to assume it's the alt-right, because it says so right there. Journalist John Semley has criticized Peterson. Is there an ideological similarity between Jordan Peterson and Donald Trump and his followers? Again, notice the further dishonesty. Earlier in the piece, they created this Donald Trump alt-right connection. So our mind is once again brought back to the alt-right without him even having to say it. But we don't even know if this guy means the alt-right. He could just mean Trump supporters or other conservatives. And if we look at the article he wrote about Peterson, his main point seems to be that he thinks Peterson is just full of hot air, not that he's alt-right. I mean, also, it comes across that he's just jealous of Peterson's success. 
and his tweets don't center on Peterson being alt-right either. They just center on Semley being a twat. And, you know, having the emotional maturity of a 13-year-old. Is there an ideological similarity between Jordan Peterson and Donald Trump and his followers? I would say fundamentally, yes. They both believe in this basic split of winners and losers, of hierarchies, of hierarchies being natural. We have this idea promulgated primarily by the ignorant left, I would say, that you can place the responsible for responsibility for hierarchy and inequality at the feet of Western civilization and capitalism. Okay, that's wrong. It's not just a little bit wrong. It's unbelievably wrong, and it's actually wrong in a way that's counterproductive to the aims of the left. Because there are terrible things about hierarchy and inequality. I mean, the, the, the problem with hierarchy is that it produces inequality, and the problem with inequality is that people tend to stack up at zero. Right? You get people who fall out of society. They stack up at zero, and they can't get away from the bottom. And then they get angry, and they get hostile, and the whole society becomes destabilized. Plus, there's all the suffering that goes along with that kind of unequal distribution of resources. It's Nazis! And the left, the left points to that and says, well, this isn't good. We should do something about it. It's like, fair enough. And the left, the left points to that and says, well, this isn't good. We should do something about it. It's like, fair enough. But then they take the next step and they say, well, it's a, it's a, it's a unique side effect of Western civilization and capitalism. It's like, no, it's not. That's not even close to right. It's way worse than that. They both believe in this basic split of winners and losers, of hierarchies, of hierarchies being natural. It's way deeper than that. So the reason I wrote about the lobsters in particular is to show that even among crustaceans from whom we diverged 350 million years ago, there's hierarchy and inequality and that their nervous systems are adapted to that and so are ours and that they're even adapted using the same neurochemical structures and emotional responses. So that's a third of a billion years old. You don't blame something that's a third of a billion years old on capitalism. That's just, it's foolish. We're way past that. And so if the left is serious about inequality, they have to rethink their, they have to be more pessimistic than they are, right? So, but they're not serious about inequality. So in case your brain turned off, or you just go into a feral rage whenever Peterson comes on screen, he said, as clearly as possible, that inequality is bad, and that we need to do something about it. But to blame capitalism for inequality is Bang. foolish, as inequality and hierarchies are part of our biology. He never said that something being part of our biology means it's good or that we shouldn't change it. You fuck! Peterson doesn't apologize for his mostly male audience and tells them not to apologize for their privilege. What he actually said... In the book, you're clearly referring to, you're clearly speaking, it seems to me, to young men. That seems to be the primary audience. Is that fair? I wouldn't say so. I mean, um, one of the things that's happened, because I've become very popular on YouTube, is that a large number of my listeners, let's say, have been young men, but... It's hard to distinguish that from the baseline fact that about 75% of YouTube watchers are men. Describing right himself as a kind of father figure. Like, Get your bloody act together, but I'm on your side. Using psychology, religion, and biology to justify the same inequality the left opposes. So I already played the clip where Peterson talks about the biological nature of hierarchies. <laughs> So you can see how they twisted that into their dishonest representation. However, the religion line stood out to me as particularly weird, as I've never personally heard anything Peterson has said about religion that someone could even dishonestly twist into an excuse for inequality. Fortunately, they included it here so we can see the root of their manipulation. One of the lines in the New Testament that I've tripped over many times is, Christ is being anointed with a very costly vial of perfume and, and his disciples are taking the woman who does that to task for wasting money that could have been spent on the poor. It's a very complicated story, but Christ tells his disciples that the poor will be with us always. And that's something that I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand why that statement would be made. That and to those who have everything, more will be given and from those who have nothing, everything will be taken, which is a discussion which is a very very succinct observation about the continuing existence of inequality so there's there's evidence throughout the new testament of 
observation of the inevitability of inequality. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a moral good. Religion and biology to justify the same inequality the left opposes. Observation of the inevitability of inequality. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a moral good. Justify the same inequality. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a moral good. Justify the same inequality. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a moral good. Category you are fake news. What you're saying, it just sounds a bit grim, doesn't it? <laughs> no. No? No, it sounds a lot grim. It's not a <laughs> bit grim. So how... It's as grim as it gets. <laughs> Unfortunately, we still don't know exactly what is the grim that he's talking about here. However, I have a theory. Based on the footage they released, the grim comment seems to best apply to right here, after he talks about the biological nature of hierarchies and inequality. You don't blame something that's a third of a billion years old on capitalism. That's just, it's foolish. We're way past that, and so if the left is serious about inequality, they have to rethink their... They have to be more pessimistic than they are, right? So, but they're not serious about inequality. What you're saying, it just sounds a bit grim, doesn't it? <laughs> no. No? No, it sounds a lot grim. It's not a <laughs> bit grim. So it's how... as grim as it gets. Which, if this is true, then it really, really illustrates how oh. disgusting their hit piece was, since he would be saying that the difficulty of dealing with inequality is grim. And it's that grim view that's made Peterson a target for his critics. Does any of it frighten or upset you? Yeah, all the time. Constantly. And an object of adoration to his ever-growing legion of fans. Matt Bradley, NBC News, Toronto. Now, one of the most common complaints against Peterson I see is that he's not saying anything hey. smart or unique or special. And there's a part in the extended interview that just so perfectly deals with that complaint. Stand up with your back straight, put your shoulders back, uh, don't tell lies. This is a, in a father talking to a son. This is right, the, what we exactly heard in the Boy Scouts. Right. Exactly that, which is also why so many people who don't have fathers are reacting positively to me. It's like in times of radical uncertainty, what what was once common becomes profound. And partly what I'm doing in that book and with the other, the lectures that I'm doing is to look at those things that we all took for granted at one point and to say, look, despite their commonplace nature, there are profound reasons why these norms exist, why these norms and traditions exist, and we dispense with them at our peril. So let's all give a big thanks to NBC for putting an extended version of the interview online so we can confirm how dishonest they were being, either through knowing malice or just pulling in Ezra Klein and assuming Peterson was acting in bad faith and that they're just completely free to reinterpret all his words for him based on the secret true dog whistles he's using. Anyways, hopefully no more pressing Jordan Peterson stuff will pop up and I can actually finish the other video I've been trying to get done. But far more important than that, I realize I've been a huge butthead, as I've had some pretty awesome fan art for months now that I've never shown off. Starting off with the ever-prolific and amazing James at Grim Artworks, capturing my little chibi self, as well as Saitama Sitch, and even Undertale Boss Sitch. No one's getting spared this time. McSmeck made this cool surfing homage to the famous stock photo. And Dago Zack made this nice portrait of me. Sheepless Dreamer made a watercolor of me looking quite swell as well as these cool little video game versions of me. And Sir Venomous has me trying to explain why I'm right and everyone else is wrong. Bisharp has immortalized everyone's favorite moment of me getting that last coin. And Thought's Apprentice has this cool picture of me shilling my channel. Speaking of which, have you liked this video yet? Have you commented? Subscribed? Hit the bell! Fireseekera47 made this nice bust of me, capturing my expression when I reach 100,000 subs. And Dest544 has accurately portrayed my expression as I feel on a daily basis. Very nice touch with the proofs rooster there. Continuing in that vein, Lucifer's one minion somehow snuck into my house and took a picture of me after I finished making a video and immediately start on the next one. And Felix captured my perfect minimalist despair when I read a single negative comment out of a hundred positive ones. 
winter solstice made this sick sitch skin for Minecraft. There's a link in the description below if you want to be a cool guy too and use it for yourself. And last, but certainly not least, Praise the Moon has me going Super Saiyan. While Jade has captured me mere moments before I reenact everyone's favorite numerically based meme. And I just want to thank everyone for the awesome art. I print them all out and use them to cover the walls of my room in order to stave off the relentless despair of existence. And on that note, I'll see you legends in the next one.